Last year, a Nielsen survey revealed that rugby is the fastest growing sport in the country. Four decades ago, it was a little known game with passionate players and very few fans. But all that changed in 1981 when something that happened right here in the capital region caused rugby to dominate the headlines. Not because of the rough and tumble nature of the game, but because of an ugly political policy. And that is tonight's CBS 6 Rewind. Stare long enough at this empty field and you can almost see the shadows of the epic battle played out here 41 years ago. There's no historical marker to commemorate the moment because some still wish it never happened. Rewind to 1981, the year the sport of rugby became a national sensation for all the wrong reasons. You've got a team that's entirely white, with the exception of one player. A government-sponsored form of racism known as apartheid had turned the world champion South African Springboks into a worldwide pariah. The players took a different view. Rugby is played for sportsmanship and sportsmanship hard. only, for no, with no political motivations whatsoever. And yet, despite an international outcry, the Springboks embarked on a U.S. tour that would take them to the unlikeliest of places. Albany, New York. Tom Selfridge was the rugby union official who brought the team here. We're opposed to apartheid. Uh, the groups that have come here are not opposed to rugby. Uh, so it's just a matter of sorting out uh, different issues and philosophies. For thousands of local protesters, the idea that the capital region would welcome a national team from South Africa to play rugby and by extension promote their state-sponsored racism was unthinkable. The message is clear. It's uh, spring box, go home, racism isn't uh, welcome in Albany. That vehement community reaction was not the only battle brewing. Arastus Corning had been the iron-fisted mayor of Albany for 40 years. He insisted that freedom of expression demanded that the game had to be played, even though... There's no possible guarantee that people will not cause trouble. That's what is the case with all violence. Hugh Carey was nearing the end of his second term as governor. He put his foot down. I, as an American citizen, simply can't understand what the team is doing here. I don't know how they got visas. I hope the match doesn't take place. Kerry issued an executive order canceling the game, but ultimately a terse one-word ruling from the Supreme Court decided it. Kerry's executive order was denied. My position uh, never, never wavered uh, against probably the, uh, I'm sure, the most intense pressure. I ever had in almost 40 years as, uh, as mayor. The legal victory sent civil rights advocates into overdrive. Just as we're trying to get rid of Jim Crow in this country, South Africa has got to get rid of apartheid. That was iconic folk singer Pete Seeger leading one of the protests. He would be one of thousands to take a stand. The demonstration is on and that we will stop the apartheid rugby tour. It will be stopped. That kind of rhetoric sent waves of alarm to the capital city. You're opening the newspaper and you're reading, oh, the American Nazi party is going to show up, that's going to scare a lot of people. The fear was well-founded. The night before the game, a bomb threat was called into a local radio station. 20 minutes later, an explosion shattered three downtown Schenectady businesses, including the Eastern Rugby Union offices. The culprit was never found. We have no idea at this time. Yeah. To what extent uh, is the damage inside? It's ex uh, extensive. But in the end, it was neither that violent act, nor the mayor, nor the governor, nor federal judges, not even the Supreme Court, that had the final say in how it all turned out. It was the weather. Hell no to apartheid. Hell no to racism. 2,000 protesters braved a steady downpour to walk from the state capitol to Albany's Bleecker Stadium to make their outrage known. On the field, the world's best team played like the champions they were, drubbing the Eastern Rugby Union 40 to nothing. No one was hurt, the demonstrators had made their point peacefully, and a constitutional protection was upheld. There was just one thing. A second game was scheduled between the same two teams. Fearing he would not be able to stem the violence well, a second time, Selfridge quietly called an end around, changing the day, time, and location of the game. This overgrown polo field in Glenville was where it all played out in the end. I'm back here for the first time since reporting from the sidelines. For reasons of security, the only people that were informed that the game would be played this afternoon were the state police. The Springboks beat the U.S. Eagles 38-7 to in a game that still managed to be a record setter. The 20 or so people that showed up at the game are officially the fewest number of people to officially witness an international rugby competition. 
And even though the rugby games played in Albany and Glenville may not have brought down apartheid, they may have helped. This turned a big spotlight on apartheid as a state-sponsored disease. And six years later, South Africa would be banned from international rugby for its apartheid policy. And then again in 1991. By 1993, South Africa's long-standing racist policy was over. It would be 37 years, though, before the Springboks came back to the United States to play Wales in a matchup in Washington, D.C. Forty-three years ago, a stranger came to the city of Mechanicville offering to buy a new car for everyone he met. Dozens and dozens of people were all set to kick the tires. But in the end, there was just one catch. And that's tonight's CBS 6 Rewind. <laughs> It's almost like the start of a bad joke. A man walks into a car dealership. You're offering a thousand people automobiles. The setup was simple. He wasn't asking for money from the people up front. So you just knew the punchline was going to be good. The area went wild. Well, why not believe it? I was going to get a new car. You were going to get a new car. What harm is there in just hoping? But he had also at one time promised me a boat. But in the end, the joke was on the people of Mechanicville waiting for those new wheels. Last night, he, the money was supposed to be flown in. It wasn't flown in. Today, it isn't here yet. A scam that left everyone involved scratching their heads. He told me to come down and I was supposed to get a car. I took a chance like everybody else. I didn't invest no money. This was more than idle talk. There were actual contracts drawn up, 183 to be exact. I could have had anything I wanted. And what'd you buy? An LTD wagon. He told you not to say a word? When did he tell you this? Bob John Ray's bizarre offer found hundreds of people waiting for a set of keys with their hands out and the press hot on his heels. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it in my life. So investigate they did, running down the five W's at every turn. But we can't get involved in this yet. Come in without the camera and I'll explain it to you. To the dismay of the car dealership. Can we come in? Without the camera and microphone and I'll explain it to you. Why won't you explain it? Because here? he said it. He said what? Close the door. So let's just rewind to how Bob John Ray drove a whole city down a detour to disappointment. This is about controlling and manipulating other people. The who was obvious. An unassuming looking guy with three first names and no apparent ties to Mechanicville. We had no background on, there was no way of checking on him. The where was pretty straightforward. Here at the Ford dealership, then owned by Jack Byrne, who had never met Bob John Ray before he showed up in Mechanicville. Jack stood to make a lot of money if this deal went through, so he kept his fingers crossed. He was here about five minutes ago, right? And he said that he was back to reassure us that it wasn't a hoax. If the why had no clear answer, the when was equally cloudy. He said, just have faith, the money's coming. And that's what he's been telling us all along, but I think everybody here and all the people that are involved in this are just losing a lot of faith in what he said. And in the end, what was missing was the cash. Let's see the money. He said the money's coming. I'm waiting for three days now. I need the money. Do you actually have the money? Yes, sir. Where is it coming from? It'll be in any time, sir. How? By plane tonight is arriving. She'll be here very shortly. Nothing camera shy about this Canadian stranger who took Mechanicville by storm. I don't mean to blow their minds. I don't know if I wanted them to do is where they could enjoy something that somebody wants to reach out and give them something and not ask anything back in return. There were those who called it an opportunity to put Mechanicville on the map. Even if it does uh, turn out to be a hoax, in some ways at least people had a little brightened day. They had something to talk about. While others say this was a dirty deed. Getting people's hopes up and then dash their hopes. That's not just manipulative, that's cruel. But you can't pick the car up today unless he pays for it. He got pleasure out of creating harm or pain in others. A man long on sentiment, well, but short on specifics. Right well, sir, that I'm not gonna say, but I'm not gonna tell you. I'm not gonna say, thank you. To all appearances, Bob John Ray never got anything out of the hoax, except a free train ride out of town, where reports say he tried to drive one last hard bargain. He was talking to the conductor, what did he tell the conductor? Uh, I guess uh, if he could sit up front with him in the engine compartment, he'd buy him a new Cadillac. 
the salesman who stood to make a big commission on those cars did not want to go on camera for our rewind, but told me that there were 183 contracts drawn up, and he said if the deals had gone through, this would have been in the Guinness Book of World Records as the biggest new car sales deal of all time. I, this has been the talk of the newsroom for several <laughs> days here. Everybody wanted to find out what happened with this. It's so crazy. It, it was such a big story at the time. I mean, it was our lead story for five straight days <laughs> until Bob John Ray was kind of ushered out of town quickly, probably for his own safety. Probably. I mean, there was a lot of people who really believed in him. and. As you can see, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't like he was particularly charismatic or anything. Somehow he just convinced him. I'm not gonna say thank you. That's wow, it. very cool. Yeah. Wow, good stuff. Thank you.